The release of diplomatic cables by WikiLeaks and their publication in the New York Times and other news organizations have generated a serious discussion about the role of the press in publishing secrets. As executive editor of the Times, Bill Keller has been in the middle of this conversation. Among other things, the controversy about the WikiLeaks release has been for him something of a teaching moment about journalism and the role of a free press in our country. Bill has talked about the care his newspaper has taken in deciding what and what not to publish, about the enduring role of responsible reporting and editing in giving readers an illuminating account of how U.S. foreign policy is made, how well it is working, and what kind of relationships our country has with allies and adversaries. He has been candid in acknowledging the risks that an aggressive free press can be injurious to America's diplomacy, and he has challenged the view of those who say that the government alone should be the judge of what is in the national interest. Of all the challenges inherent in this story, the potential legal risks, the anticipated criticism from whatever the newspaper decided to do, the daunting tasks of sorting and selecting from such a vast archive, the painstaking work of redacting potentially damaging material, the complications of coordinating a publication schedule with other news organizations, and developing, finally, a strategy to respond to demands, such as that of Senator Lieberman, that the U.S. Justice Department investigate whether the Times has committed a crime by publishing articles based on the cables leaked to WikiLeaks. None of these challenges ever overcomes the excitement of a great story. Or, to put the question rhetorically, as the Times public editor did a few weeks ago, what if the paper had decided to pass on the documents that WikiLeaks was making available? What if the newspaper had just decided to suppress the story? Bill, it's a great honor to have you here, to welcome you, and to invite you to offer your perspective on this important story. My aim here is to um, bore you all into submission so that the uh, question and answer period goes smoothly from my point of view. <coughs> uh, based, based on the panel I just watched, that's probably not going to happen, but I'm going to do my damnedest. <laughs> um, about four years ago, I was invited to speak at the University of Michigan on the subject of secrets, national security, and the press. Um, obviously, a lot's happened in the four years since I gave that speech, and in fact, a lot's happened just in the last four weeks. Um, but I believe the fundamental issues remain essentially un unchanged. So even after, the, uh, and that's true even after the tsunami of secrets unleashed by WikiLeaks. Uh, and I also think that it's useful to take the long view on this question of uh, the press and secrecy. So in the unlikely event that anyone in this audience was present in Ann Arbor in 2006, uh, you may recognize my talk today as a considerably updated version of that lecture, uh, which either exposes my lack of imagination or, or shows that I have a sturdy sense of consistency. Um, on my desk in New York, I keep my all-time favorite piece of reader feedback, dating back to a couple of years that I spent uh, in blissful exile on the uh, New York Times op-ed page. Uh, it's an angry postcard that arrived from a nun named Sister Veronica McRooney after I wrote a column that suggested certain similarities between the Vatican and the Kremlin. Um, <coughs> The postcard is a picture of the Pope with Cardinal O'Connor, and the message was typed on the back with an actual typewriter. It concludes as follows. Obey your holy priests and bishops, or risk excommunication, anathema, and eternal hellfire. <laughs> Two exclamation points. <clears throat> uh, as the wayward product of a Catholic education, I can tell you that I responded to that postcard by sitting up straight and folding my hands on the desk where sister could see them. <clears throat> 
And when I finally got my current job in 2003, I propped Sister Veronica's postcard on my desk to remind myself to be humble. As it turned out, I would have lots and lots of other reminders. The people who wake up every morning intent on keeping me humble include the faith-based partisans of the right and left, the vigilantes of the blogosphere, the radio talk show hosts and television shouting heads, the bottom feeders of our own homegrown gossip columns, uh, and a legion of media obsessives. Our critics include readers of the New York Times, a bright, engaged, and opinionated audience that's still convinced we signed on with Satan when we removed their Sunday TV guide from the print editions. And on top of all that, we actually pay somebody good money, a public editor we call him, to griddle us in the pages of the New York Times. So as a staunch believer in free speech, I am regularly hoist on my own petard. Among that critical chorus, no subject has provoked a higher pitch of indignation than our decisions from time to time to publish secret information, especially secret information concerning wars in progress or the more diffuse struggle against terrorists seeking to do us harm. At least until this year, nothing the Times had done on my watch had caused nearly so much agitation as two stories we published about tactics employed by the Bush administration after the attacks of September 11th. One article, which was published in 2005 and won a Pulitzer, revealed that the National Security Agency was eavesdropping on domestic phone and email conversations without the legal courtesy of a warrant. The other, published in 2006, described a vast Treasury Department program to screen international banking records. Both of these programs, the domestic eavesdropping and the bank surveillance, uh, banking surveillance, were designed to catch terrorists. And just in case you're wondering, I'm in favor of that. Um, both of these programs were highly classified, so classified, in fact, that some members of Congress who would normally expect to have oversight of these activities were kept out of the loop. And in both cases, senior officials of our government argued strenuously beforehand that the Times should not publish, that to do so would give a lethal advantage to enemies of America. My only experience of the Bush Oval Office was a visit in which the President advised me and my publisher that if we revealed the warrantless eavesdropping program, the Times should expect to be held accountable for the next terrorist attack on America. That's not a warning one shrugs off. By the way, I recently read uh, President Bush's account of that meeting in his new book. Uh, his account is very brief, and it concludes as follows. Ten days later, Bill Keller called Steve Hadley, the National Security Advisor, to say the Times was going forward with the story. We had no chance for a closing argument. They had posted it on their website before Keller placed the call. Actually, that's not true. Uh, we posted the story only after we'd given the White House advance word of our intentions. And if uh, Mr. Bush's publisher wants recommendations of some good fact checkers before the paper back edition comes out, I'll be happy to help. Um, the White House reaction when we decided to publish was predictably fierce. The administration defended the program aggressively and meanwhile ordered the FBI to begin a leak investigation in search of our sources. After our second defense, the publication of the story about banking surveillance, the administration cranked up the outrage to a decibel level that probably violated common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions. In the course of three days, the Vice President, the President, and the Treasury Secretary took turns denouncing us as shameful and indifferent to the national interest. Members of Congress held a festival of indignation on the House floor where my paper was accused of treason. Following hard upon the official tirade, we had an amen chorus of voices questioning our motives, impugning our integrity, and suggesting appropriate sanctions. A polemic by Gabriel Schoenfeld in the magazine Commentary proposed that the Times be charged under Section 798 of the Espionage Act, which declares that it's a crime in some circumstances to publish information about, quote, communications intelligence activities. The prospect of Times editors and reporters wearing orange jumpsuits was not nearly enough for a right-wing radio pundit out in San Francisco who suggested that I should go to the gas chamber. Another stalwart defender of the national interest posted a map to my apartment on the internet with an invitation to terrorists and lunatics. If any of you are acquainted with New York apartment life, you can imagine how that went over with my co-op board. <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> the reaction to our coverage may have been hysterical, but much of it was heartfelt. I'm pretty sure the White House outburst reflected genuine frustration, a conviction that in perilous times the President needs extraordinary powers, unfettered by congressional oversight, court meddling, or the strictures of international law, and certainly safe from the attention of nosy reporters. And in the public realm, I know there is real confusion about why somebody like me should be able to defy the wishes of the President of the United States on a matter as unquestionably urgent as protecting the country from homicidal enemies. 
This debate has been rekindled this year thanks to an organization whose name at first sounded to me like a brand of adult diaper. <coughs> um, <coughs> we've, we've now published uh, three rounds of stories based on documents supplied to us by WikiLeaks, two on military field reports that illuminated aspects of the wars in, uh, the war in, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, and a series, as you all know, based on secret communications between the State Department and its outposts around the globe. This time around, the administration reaction was different from what we encountered earlier. It was mostly sober and professional and grown up. The secretaries of state and defense and the attorney general resisted the opportunity for a crowd pleasing orgy of press bashing. Uh, there has been no serious official talk, unless you count that uh, somewhat ambiguous hint by Senator Lieberman of pursuing news organizations in the courts. Uh, though the release of these documents was certainly painfully embarrassing, the State Department nonetheless engaged with us in an attempt to prevent the release of material genuinely damaging to innocent individuals or the national interest. But there has been criticism, official and otherwise, and it generally strikes three themes. One, that the documents were of dubious value because they told us nothing we didn't already know. Two, that the disclosures put lives at risk, either directly by identifying <laughs> confidential informants or indirectly by complicating our ability to build alliances against terror. And third, that by doing business with an organization like WikiLeaks, the Times and other news organizations compromise their impartiality and independence. I'll respond briefly to each point. First, I'm a little puzzled by the complaint that most of the embassy traffic we disclosed did not profoundly change our understanding of how the world works. Folks, 99% of what you read or hear on the news does not profoundly change our understanding of how the world works. News mostly advances, advances by inches and feet, not in great leaps. The value of these documents, and I believe they have immense value, is not that they expose some deep, unsuspected perfidy in high places or that they upend your whole view of the world. For those who pay close attention to foreign policy, these documents provide texture, nuance, and drama. They deepen and correct your understanding of how things unfolded. They raise or lower your estimation of world leaders. For those who do not follow these subjects as closely, the stories are an opportunity to learn more and to learn it in a particularly lively way. If a project like this makes readers pay attention, think harder, understand more clearly what is being done in their name, and I think our coverage of the WikiLeaks material has done all of those things on a grand scale, then we have performed a public service. Of course, if you'll forgive a self-serving corollary, when you're given access to years of secret dip diplomatic traffic and the contents do not cause you to gasp in amazement, that suggests the news media have been doing a pretty good job over the years of getting things mostly right. As for the risks posed by these releases, they are real. WikiLeaks' first data dump, the publication of Afghanistan war logs, included the names of confidential informants that the Times and other news organizations had carefully purged from our own coverage. WikiLeaks was roundly criticized for putting lives at risk, and it, in its subsequent postings, it has largely followed the example of the news organizations and redacted material that could get people jailed or killed. Whether this practice is adequate and whether it will continue is beyond my power to predict or influence. WikiLeaks does not take guidance from the New York Times. In the end, I can only answer for what my own paper has done, and I believe that we have behaved responsibly. Now, as for the idea that the mere publication of such a wholesale collection of secrets uh, will make other countries less willing to do business with our diplomats, uh, I'm skeptical. And I will summon to my defense the defense secretary himself, who called that concern overwrought and pointed out that foreign governments cooperate with us not because they necessarily love us, not because they trust us to keep all of their secrets, but because they need us. And in the somewhat more jaundiced view of Fuad Ajami of Johns Hopkins, foreign leaders will continue to talk to us. It's the way of power to brag. As for our relationship with WikiLeaks, throughout this experience, we have regarded Julian Assange and his merry band of hackers and anarchists and provocateurs as a source. I will not say a source pure and simple, because as any reporter or editor in this room can attest, sources are rarely pure or simple. You don't, as a rule, endorse their agenda, echo their rhetoric, applaud their methods, or, most important, allow them to shape or censor your journalism. Your obligation as an independent news organization is to verify the material if you can, to supply context, to exercise responsible judgment about what to publish and what not, and to make sense of it. 
That's what we attempted to do, as we would do with any documents that fell into our possession. In the days after we launched our respective series on the embassy cables, both Alan Rusbridger, the editor of The Guardian in London, and I went online to answer questions from our readers. The Guardian, uh, which bills itself as a center-left paper and which has a readership somewhat more sympathetic to the guerrilla sensibilities of WikiLeaks, was pelted with comments along the lines of, how dare you censor these documents? What are you hiding? Post everything now. <clears throat> The mail sent to the Times, at least in the first day or two, came from uh, a somewhat different perspective, I would say. Many readers were indignant and alarmed. Who needs this? How dare you? Who made you God? The questions are natural and by no means new, though I think they arrive now with a heightened tone of anguish. That's partly because September 11th introduced a new sense of vulnerability in our country. It's partly the popular sense that the elite media has become too big for its britches a notion loudly encouraged by the Fox News wing of conservative opinion. And it is partly a symptom of a national conversation that has overall become more polarized and strident. Decisions to, public class to publish classified information are certainly not driven by indifference to the fate of the country. In fact, journalists at the Times have a large and personal stake in the country's security. For starters, we live and work in a city that has been tragically marked as a favorite terrorist target. Our journalists plunged into the fiery ruins to tell the story of 9-11. Moreover, the Times has nine staff correspondents assigned to the two wars still being waged in the wake of that attack in Iraq and Afghanistan, plus a rotating cast of photographers, visiting writers, and scores of local stringers and support staff. They work in this high-risk environment because while there are lots of places you can go for opinions about the war, there are few places, and fewer by the day, where you can go to find honest, on-the-scene reporting about what's actually happening. We take extraordinary precautions to keep them safe, uh, but we've had two of our local journalists murdered for doing their jobs. We've had four journalists held hostage by the Taliban, in one case for seven months. We had one Afghan journalist killed in a rescue attempt. And last month, while I was in Kabul, we got word that a photographer embedded for us with troops near Kandahar had stepped on an IED and lost both of his legs. We're invested in the struggle against murderous extremism in another sense. The virulent hatred espoused by terrorists, judging by their literature, is directed not just against our people and our buildings, it is also aimed at our values and at our faith in the self-government of an informed electorate. If the freedom of the press makes some Americans uneasy, it is anathema to the ideologists of terror. So we have no doubts about where our sympathies lie in this clash of values. And yet, we cannot let those sympathies transform us into propagandists, even for a system we respect. The conflict between the government's passion for secrecy and the press's drive to reveal is not, of course, of recent origin. Nearly 40 years ago, in the Supreme Court ruling that stopped the government from suppressing the secret Vietnam history called the Pentagon Papers, Justice Hugo Black wrote, quote, the government's power to censor the press was abolished so that the press could remain forever free to censure the government. The press was protected so that it could bear the secrets of the government and inform the public. In recent years, aggressive reporters have brought you a great deal of information that the White House never intended for you to know. Classified secrets about the questionable intelligence that led the country to war in Iraq, about the abuse of prisoners in Iraq and Afghanistan, about the alleged massacre in Haditha, about the transfer of suspects to countries where interrog interrogation techniques probably do not fit our definition of humane about eavesdropping without warrants and other things. As Bob Kaiser of the Washington Post asked at the time of the eavesdropping controversy, you may have been shocked by these revelations or maybe not disturbed at all by them, but would you have preferred not to know them at all? If a war is being waged in America's name, shouldn't Americans understand how it is being waged? Government officials understandably want it both ways. They want us to protect their secrets and they want us to trumpet their successes. This too is nothing new. I hope you'll indulge me another wallow in the Pentagon Papers case. Although the specific issue at the time, whether the government could restrain the press from publishing, whether it could censor the news, is not quite the issue we face now, the debate over the Pentagon Papers produced a rich literature on the subject of government secrets. And one of the finest documents to emerge from the voluminous legal history of that case is the affidavit filed at the district court level by one of my predecessors, Max Frankel. At the time, 
Max was the paper's Washington bureau chief, and in his affidavit, he described the role of secrets in the ritual life of Washington. Presidents make secret decisions only to reveal them for the purposes of frightening an adversary nation, wooing a friendly electorate, protecting their reputations, he wrote. The military services conduct secret research in weaponry only to reveal it for the purpose of enhancing their budgets, appearing superior or inferior to a foreign army, gaining the vote of a congressman or the favor of a contractor. The Navy uses secret information to run down the weaponry of the Air Force. The Army passes on secret information to prove its superiority to the Marine Corps. High officials of the government reveal secrets in the search for support of their policies or to help sabotage the plans and policies of rival departments. Middle rank officials of government reveal secrets so as to attract the attention of their superiors or to lobby against the orders of those superiors. That is very much the way things still work in Washington. The Treasury Secretary at the time of our uh, bank, uh, report on the bank monitoring program, John Snow, was utterly scandalized by our decision to publish. But in September 2003, a few years earlier, the same Secretary of Snow invited a group of reporters to travel with him and his aides on a military aircraft for a six-day junket to show off the department's efforts to track terrorist financing. The Secretary's team discussed many sensitive details of their monitoring efforts, hoping they would appear in print and demonstrate the administration's relentlessness against the terrorist threat. So one man's security breach is another man's PR campaign, and sometimes they're the same man. For further evidence that our government is highly selective in its approach to secrets, look no further than Bob Woodward's all but authorized accounts of the innermost deliberations of our government. Max Frankel, in his Pentagon Papers affidavit, acknowledged the self-serving nature of these transactions on both sides, but concluded that this, what he called, cooperative, competitive, antagonistic, and arcane relationship was essential to the working of democracy. Without this trafficking in secrets, he said, there could be no adequate diplomatic, military, and political reporting of the kind our people take for granted, either abroad or in Washington, and there could be no mature system of communication between the government and its people. Max, by the way, weighed in recently on the WikiLeaks controversy in The Guardian, of all places, <coughs> um, noting that an estimated three million people have access to the database from which the secret cables were pilfered. He wrote, governments must finally acknowledge that secrets shared with millions of cleared officials, including lowly army clerks, are not secret. They must decide that the random rubber stamping of millions of papers and computer files each year does not a security system make. What common sense has so far failed to teach, technology will surely now command. Chase away the WikiLeaks enterprise, and another web-savvy crowd will reopen for business within hours. The threat of massive leaks will persist so long as there are massive secrets. An ambassador needing to protect a confidence needs to limit his audience to a few superiors. A diplomat looking to educate the government at large needs to hide his authorship of widely circulated reportage. How do we, as editors, reconcile the obligation to inform, which is our fundamental purpose, with the responsibility to protect? Sometimes the judgments are easy. Our reporters in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, take great care not to divulge operational intelligence in their reports, knowing that in this internet age, it could be seen and used by hostile combatants. In our handling of the WikiLeaks documents, as I said, we excise the names of informants, dissidents, human rights act, uh, activists, academics, and others who would be endangered if their conversations with American diplomats were known. Often the calculations are far more difficult. There is no magic formula, no neat metric, either for the public's interest or for the dangers of publishing sensitive information. We make our best considered judgment. When we come down in favor of publishing, of course, everyone hears about it. <coughs> uh, when we exercise restraint, most of the time, few people are aware. But editors of major American papers have, in the past few years, had the experience of withholding or postponing articles when the administration convinced us that the risk of publication outweighed the benefits. The Washington Post, in disclosing that the CIA was imprisoning terror suspects at secret locations in allied countries, withheld the identities of those host countries. The Los Angeles Times chose not to publish the contents of computer hard drives purchased by reporters in an Afghan bazaar. My own paper has held articles that, if published, might have jeopardized efforts to protect vulnerable stock stockpiles of nuclear material. 
Probably the most discussed example of restraint was my decision not to disclose the NSA eavesdropping program when we first learned of it. It took more than a year of further reporting before I was convinced that we knew enough to publish the, despite the President's personal plea for secrecy. For that caution, the Times was castigated by critics of the Bush administration who speculated that if we'd rushed the information into print before the 2004 elections, the outcome might have been different. I tend to doubt that so, but in any case, I could not in good conscience publish the story <clears throat> until I was confident the public value of exposing it outweighed the danger of putting lives at risk. I understand that honorable people may disagree with any of these choices, the decision to publish or the decision not to publish, but making those decisions is the responsibility that falls to editors, a corollary to the great gift of our independence. It is not, as I have said, a responsibility we take lightly, and it is not one we can surrender to the government, which has no interest in disclosing its own transgressions or abuses. This is exactly why the inventors of this country, having emerged from an imperial form of government, embraced an unruly press, and the press in those days was at least as unruly as it is now. At this point, some of you may be asking under your breath, okay, Mr. Wise Guy Editor, <clears throat> now what? How do we prevent this collision of secrecy and press freedom from becoming a spectacular pileup in the courts? I'm not a lawyer, nor am I a policymaker. I've always been happier on the sidelines of history. Um, so what follows is just the view of one editor, and it will be more rumination than prescription. One of the hangovers of my Catholic upbringing is that I tend to divide things into three. Uh, in, this case, <coughs> in this case, I think of the problem from three directions, the newsroom, the law, and the government. <coughs> Frankly, I don't see a way to alter journalistic practice that will avoid clashes with the government unless we were to adopt the kind of deferential mouthpiece journalism common to countries with one-party governments. As journalists in a robust democracy, our responsibility is to publish information of interest to the public, and that includes publishing secrets when we can find them. We are constrained by the professional code I summarized earlier. We feel obliged to be careful in what we publish, careful to get it right, careful to play it straight, careful to consider any reasonable claim that publication will put lives at risk. In the cases I've described, I believe we satisfy those obligations. There is one thing we can do that may improve our standing in this perennial contest with the government. We can be a little more judicious in our use of anonymous sources. Just to be clear, the ability to offer protection to a source is an essential of our craft. None of the stories I described earlier would have been reported without recourse to this particular tool. You will occasionally hear an editor suggest that news organizations should forswear anonymous sources altogether. This is high-minded foolishness. Without the option of protecting sources, with recourse only to an increasingly redacted public record, the coverage of government and other powerful institutions would tend more and more towards press conference stenography. But a more selective and clear-headed use of unnamed sources could have beneficial effects. For one thing, it, could improve our, our it would improve our credibility with the public, which ultimately decides the fate of press bashing politicians. I suspect that the media's heavy reliance on unattributed information contributes to a suspicion that reporters make things up or that newspapers allow themselves to be used on behalf of one agenda or another. The too casual reliance on unnamed sources is both corrosive and unnecessary. <laughs> that offers no comfort to those who believe we should stop publishing secrets, but it might put us in a somewhat less precarious position when we do publish secrets. That brings us to the state of the law. Uh, there are those, like Gabriel Schoenfeld, who argue that the Espionage Act should be applied or amended to punish news organizations that disclose national security-related secrets. But the Espionage Act has never been applied to a news organization, and even applying it to non-journalists has proven problematic. After a number of restrictive court rulings in the Lawrence Franklin espionage case, the Justice Department dropped its prosecution of two representatives of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee who received classified information from Franklin. Reportedly, justices had a very hard time figuring out, figuring out whether the law can be directed at Julian Assange. The main practical legal threat facing journalists these days is not the Espionage Act, but the subpoena, in particular the subpoena issued as part of a government leak investigation or in civil suits where a litigant is trying to establish the identity of a source who disclosed damaging information. In the decades after the Supreme Court in the 1972 Brandsburg case, left reporters vulnerable to being summoned before grand juries, there were relatively few cases in which reporters were compelled to reveal confidential sources. 
Since the turn of the millennium, however, according to a survey published in the Minnesota Law Review, federal and state courts issue hundreds of subpoenas each year asking for the identities of confidential sources in criminal and civil cases. To many of us in the journalism business, the great hope has been for a federal shield law which would afford reporters at least some protection against being forced to divulge sources, the kind of protections already accorded to defense counsel, doctors, ministers, and other professionals whose work depends on assurances of confidentiality. The reality, however, <coughs> is that enactment of a federal shield law does not seem imminent, and if one is enacted, it's likely to contain an enormous loophole for information related to national security. So now we come to the government. <coughs> The thing that has worked most effectively over the decades to maintain a healthy equilibrium between press freedom and national security is not something codified in the law. It is common sense. It is compromise and accommodation. I'm going to return once more to Max Frankel's affidavit in the Pentagon Papers case. He described for the court the unwritten but generally observed etiquette of what he called mature press relations. For the vast majority of secrets, he wrote, there has developed between the government and the press a rather simple rule of thumb. The government hides what it can, pleading necessity as long as it can, and the press prizes, prize out what it can, pleading a need and a right to know. Each side in this game regularly wins or loses a round or two. Each fights with the weapons at its command. When the government loses a secret or two, it simply adjusts to a new reality. Alexander Bickel also worked over this issue in his seminal volume of legal philosophy, The Morality of Consent. Uh, Bickle was the chief counsel for the Times in the Pentagon Papers case. Bickle argues that ambiguity and ambivalence are the lubricants that allow the First Amendment to function. The government, he writes, has the right and the responsibility to protect legitimate secrets, and yet it is constrained in many ways in what it can do to guard those secrets. It may not legally break and enter or steal or spy electronically without a judicial warrant. It cannot restrain anyone from publishing a secret unless it can prove immediate harm of the gravest sort. We have no official secrets act, he wrote, and can have none restraining publication of most secrets. The government cannot copyright anything. The government has great power to enforce secrecy at the source, but has little recourse once the secrets have escaped. The government may guard mightily against serious but more ordinary leak, uh, against, uh, uh, sorry, lost my track here. The accommodation works well only when there is forbearance and continence on both sides, Bickle concludes. It threatens to break down when the adversaries turn into enemies, when they break diplomatic relations with each other, gird for and wage war. Such conditions threaten graver breakdowns yet, eroding popular trust and confidence in both government and the press, on which effective exercise of the function of both depends. This argument assumes a respectful, if adversarial, relationship between an establishment press and a government that accepts the value of compromise in the conduct of public affairs. It's arguable whether we, whether we have either of those things today. The notion of an establishment press is at least under siege. The Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Associated Press, the three television networks and their kin are no longer society's common source of news to the extent that they were in the past. Long before WikiLeaks was born, the internet transformed the landscape of journalism creating a wide open market with a quicker metabolism, a new infrastructure for sharing information, and a diminished respect for notions of privacy and secrecy. This democratization of the media has brought healthy change, introducing new voices and new audiences to the national conversation, but it has contributed to a blurring of the very definition of who is a journalist. I think a news organization like mine should be a little humble about trying to define who's entitled to be called a journalist. And personally, I would advocate a fairly expansive definition. But it's likely that the legions of internet journalists includes at least a few who would not share my compunction about disclosing life-threatening information. <laughs> I suspect the official custodians of America's secrets would say that Max Frankel's rule of thumb, the idea that government should accept an occasional loss and learn to live with it, is no longer operative in a world where anyone with an internet service provider can be a publisher. Daniel Ellsberg needed the New York Times. WikiLeaks does not. So far, however, mainstream news organizations are more likely to unearth important secrets than rogue bloggers. We have reporters dedicated to the hard, painstaking work of reporting on national security issues, developing sources, building trust, piecing together details into patterns. 
Contrary to popular mythology, sensitive secrets do not generally fall into our hands. They may begin with a tip from a source who has a grievance or a guilty conscience, but those tips are just the beginning. Reporters operate without security clearances, without subpoena powers, without spy technology. They work rather with sources who may be scared, who probably know only part of the story, who may have their own agendas that need to be discovered and taken into account. Reporting secret information with confidence usually entails a multitude of sources, ideally backed by documentary evidence. One of the striking things about that NSA eavesdropping story is that more than a year elapsed between the time our reporters dug out the information and the time we published it, and yet it did not surface anywhere else. The information was that hard to get. The leaders of WikiLeaks will tell you that they've changed all of that, that they have introduced a new era of hacker-enforced transparency. I'm not so sure. While it is true that there are many more seekers poking at the repositories of secret information, I don't see that the doors to America's secrets or the world's secrets have been blown wide open. It's worth pointing out that if you believe federal prosecutors, all of WikiLeaks' major breaches of security have come from a single troubled American soldier. Whether insiders uh, whether other insiders will choose to risk long prison terms by siphoning secrets to WikiLeaks, it's too early to tell. So while the mainstream press might not enjoy the hegemony it held before the internet, we have not yet fallen into information anarchy. Most of what the country knows about the secret activities of its government, it knows thanks to serious news organizations that, tills, that still take their responsibilities seriously. Across the table, however, we cannot always count on a government that is inclined, in Bickle's phrase, toward continence and forbearance. The current administration, as I noted earlier, has fit that description rather well so far, reacting calmly and professionally. But the previous administration, not so much. Much that has been said about the ostensible dangers of news, uh, much has been said about the ostensible danger of newspapers publishing news of wiretapping or bank surveillance or whatever. I'd like to turn the telescope around and pose this question. What are the consequences for our national security if our government seeks to severely curtail the flow of information? Two years ago, we said goodbye to an administration that had been more secretive, more mistrustful of an inquisitive press than any since the Nixon administration. It treated freedom of information requests with contempt, took information off of government websites, asserted claims of executive privilege over documents. The Bush administration subsidized propaganda at home and abroad, refined the art of spin, discouraged dissent, and sought to limit traditional congressional oversight and court review. The war in Iraq alone is a case study of the administration's determination to dominate the flow of information, from the original cherry picking of intelligence to the, to the deliberate refusal to hear senior military officers when they warned of the potential for chaos, to the continually inflated claims about the progress in building up an indigenous Iraqi army. And when that administration's secrets seeped out, the response was sometimes to launch the FBI and to threaten reprisals. The Bush White House did not formally endorse the creative view that the Espionage Act should be employed against journalists, but it did not hurry to disavow that view either. And administration officials were heard to suggest in private conversation that they would be tempted to propose a British-style Official Secrets Act, a move to criminalize reporting that many legal scholars regard as a frontal assault on the First Amendment. I strongly suspect that these attempts to enforce a single authorized version of the truth help explain why the most, that most secretive of administrations so often lost control of its most sensitive secrets. Military officers appalled by the rosy portrayal of our triumphs in Iraq, government lawyers disturbed by what they saw as a cavalier attitude towards civil liberties and the balance of powers, career intelligence officers who felt their work had been massaged to conform to what their superiors want to hear. I think you would find that these were among our best sources during the Bush administration. Or as our media columnist Dave Carr wrote one time, leaks tend to affect ships that aren't seaworthy to begin with. The distaste for dissent has another cost. Fighting terrorists, whatever method you choose, depends on making alliances at home and abroad. It depends on a consensus of the civilized world. And I wonder whether the discrediting of honest critics undermines the unity of purpose essential to such a struggle. A few years ago, when the outcry over our NSA eavesdropping story still echoed, Jonathan Rauch made an interesting argument in the Atlantic Monthly. Let me read it. If the country seriously intends to prevent terrorism, 
than spying at home, detaining terror suspects, and conducting tough interrogations are practices the government will need to engage in for many years to come. <coughs> Instead of making proper legal provisions for those practices, Bush has run the war against jihadism out of his back pocket as a permanent state of emergency. He engages in legal ad hocery and trickery, treats Congress as a nuisance rather than a partner, and circumvents outmoded laws and treaties when he should be creating new ones. Rauch concludes, of all President Bush's failings, his refusal to build durable underpinnings for what promises to be a long struggle is the most surprising, the most gratuitous, and potentially the most damaging, both to the sustainability of the anti-terrorism effort and to the constitutional order. If that's true, then the coverage I've been discussing, the WikiLeaks documents, the disclosure of warrantless eavesdropping, and all the rest, this coverage is not just something to defend as our constitutional right, it's something to be celebrated as our obligation to the national good. This coverage has raised important questions about the proper balance between liberty and security and about the limits on executive power in our democracy. It has somewhat emboldened the courts and Congress to play their assigned role in the system of, system of checks and balances. It has blossomed into one of the most urgent political debates of our time, joining the question of how we protect ourselves to the question of exactly what it is that we are protecting. And it is just possible that by forcing these questions onto the national agenda, the press has created the possibility of a national consensus, a foundation for the long defense of our freedoms. Speaking as a citizen, I hope it's not too late for that. And speaking as an editor, I hope those of us in the journalism world are not so preoccupied by our struggling <coughs> business model or so busy dumbing down and downsizing in pursuit of non-readers that we can't find time to think about and speak up about what our business is for. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, please introduce yourself as you uh, ask the question. Yes. Um, my name is Mabel Chan. I'm a visiting scholar with the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies. <coughs> um, can you provide a sort of a fly on the wall? behind the scenes look at the vetting process at the New York Times. How extensive, how secretive, how tricky, how unprecedented, in what ways? The vetting process on the WikiLeaks document you mean, or, yes, to, yes, or yes, yes. in general? Um, sure, I, most of it's fairly obvious. I mean, you know, we got, uh, well, we got the documents in different ways in two different bunches. But first, the, we got the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs um, uh, at the same time, uh, and then we got uh, and we got those um, directly from WikiLeaks. We got the embassy cables uh, from the Guardian after WikiLeaks decided that it was no longer very happy with the New York Times. <coughs> um, we put them into um, searchable databases. Um, we had um, initially a couple of people in our computer assisted reporting unit. Um, go through them by search. I mean, with a quarter of a million documents, you know, there's just no way everybody's going to sit down and read them. And in fact, uh, nobody, I don't think, claims to have, no news organization anyway, claims to have read all of those documents. Uh, so we navigated them by search, and we would put in a search term. It could be a country, it could be an individual leader, it could be a, a topic, um, uh, it could be, uh, you know, a phrase, uh, and we searched. I mean, we consulted uh, an, particularly in the, the uh, Iraq and Afghan war logs, a lot of reporters who were most expert in covering the military and who would have the best idea what to search for, they gave us search terms, uh, a number of them went into the database and did their own supplemental searches. That produced kind of clumps of cables. Uh, and then um, you know, somebody was assigned to go through those clumps of cables and extract the ones that looked like they had either stories or pieces of stories. Um, uh, often um, what we found uh, in the cables, in, in, in one cable, led us to search for something we hadn't thought of before. So that's, I mean, that's how we handled the data. Uh, the vetting process, um, I mean, we had to sort of establish at the outset that we think this is, this stuff is real. Um, we have a number of reporters who have uh, viewed both military, secret military dispatches and embassy cables in the past in their line of work. You know, they looked these over and from the outset it was quite clear that these were the real thing. And in fact, nobody who actually knows 
anything about the events described in those uh, uh, has yet come forward and said that that's uh, uh, false or that there's something missing. Um, uh, you know, we, d we took um, the material that we were planning to use to the respective government agency to get their, first of all, to get their comments on the stories we were going to do um, uh, and give them a chance to argue back. And second of all, to raise whatever objections they wanted to raise to uh, us publishing the cables or the, and the war logs the first time around. Um, obviously, we did not uh, offer them the right to decide, but uh, but we heard them out respectfully. And um, and I would describe. You know, I mean, I I described the process in my remarks as as sort of pr professional and grown up. And 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 I. Um, I think we found it really useful. I mean, a lot of times they wanted us to um, omit things that were just embarrassing, and we said no. Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, we, we're not in this to protect your, you know, uh, your you from embarrassment. But uh, but uh, but they uh, and we had done a, a fair amount of redacting on our own. Uh, I mean, it's pretty obvious that if some you know lowly uh, village elder in Kandahar has talked to the American military because they showed up at his door uh, and his name is in the cable, that publishing his name is probably a good way to get him killed. Uh, so a lot of that redacting went on beforehand. But in the conversations with the administration, there were, there were cases where they persuaded us, they either identified things that we hadn't recognized as potentially dangerous or argued that, you know, um, that we should withhold something. In most of those cases, we managed to tell the story without posting the actual document. Yeah. I'm Stephen Kandea from the Romanian Center for Investigative Journalism. I'm mm -hmm. curious, you published like 1% of the cables for now. What's your schedule on publishing the rest of the 99%? And will you go <coughs> through all well, I mean, the, uh, We don't have a schedule anymore. Essentially, what we, what we did was the, the first two um, data dumps, the Iraq and Afghan war logs. Um, hmm? um, the, f <coughs> the first two, two data dumps, um, WikiLeaks posted uh, after we'd had a uh, considerable length of time to, to read the documents and prepare our stories. And, and th they essentially gave us the material with an embargo, uh, a familiar enough and generally loathed but observed practice in Washington, the embargo. Um, they gave us the doc access to the documents with an embargo date, at which point they intended to post the, the, the whole trove of documents. Um, so um, in the end, they held back a portion of the Afghan documents, uh, and on the Iraq documents, they did a kind of robo redaction that uh, essentially eliminated most of the names and made them virtually unreadable. <coughs> um, so there wasn't really a schedule of, of, of publication. There was, there, was, there was this day, and on this day, we were going to write what articles we wanted to write, and they were going to post the documents. The, the embassy cables were more complicated. I mean, the, the range of subject matter was so broad. The volume was so enormous. Um, the different interests of the different news organizations, uh, you know, were, were fairly large. I mean, we weren't all that interested in, you know, what the – and U.S. Ambassador in Bonn thought of Angela Merkel. That for them was, you know, the Holy Grail <coughs> for Der Spiegel. Um, uh, so we basically agreed on a, a schedule where we would, um, you know, day one would be Pakistan Day and day two would be, you know, Russia Day or whatever, <coughs> and that we would we all wrote would write our own stories. Uh, some of us would take advantage of Russia Day and some of us wouldn't. <coughs> um, but that, but we we rolled out that schedule, uh, and we agreed to give WikiLeaks uh, the documents that we intended to post with each day's stories, uh, with our plans to redact them. Uh, I mean, we to, and WikiLeaks, um, you know, having been castigated rather broadly for the way they handled the first two document dumps, uh, said that at least. For that run of stories, they would post the redacted documents. Um, we have basically done the main 
stories that we set out to do. We're now, we're still picking over some other subject matters, but this sort of rollout of stories that we um, agreed upon with the other news organizations is, is mostly over. Uh, and um, I expect we'll, um, you know, post future documents as we think of news stories we want to do, and that we have three or four in the works that are just, they're more time consuming to, to research. Um, I have no idea what WikiLeaks tends, intends to do with whether at some point they intend to post the whole trove, whether they will do so the way they did with the Iraq documents with some sort of automated redaction process or, or what. We don't intend to post the whole, um, the whole batch. In fact, I mean, most of them are not very interesting. Um, you know, in a quarter of a million documents, you're going to get a pretty high percentage of things that are, you know, the equivalent, diplomatic equivalent of laundry lists. Um, yes. Um, Stephanie Frieda, uh, there's been a question uh, from our live feed through the blog, which is, are you planning to work with WikiLeaks in the future? And I'm also wondering um, there, if you could tell us, there's been reporting about the New York Times, of course, working with WikiLeaks directly for the war logs and then receiving the cables through The Guardian. Mm -hmm. What's the story behind that? Well, Julian Assange has never explained to me explicitly, <clears throat> you know, why they decided to cut us off after the first two rounds. But he has complained to me explicitly about a number of things that we did that he disapproved of. So I, m I intuit that the reason that he didn't give it, uh, give us that particular trove of information was because of those things that he was unhappy with. They included. Uh, the fact that we did not link to the WikiLeaks website with our first posting, which we, was a conscious decision on our part not to link. I mean, obviously, anybody can go find it. That's, so it's a, more of a symbolic gesture than, than, a, than anything with practical impact. But we were not going to link to a database that we knew was likely to include the names of, uh, you know, of innocent Afghans. Um, he was unhappy with a story that we did about Bradley Manning. We did a number of stories about Bradley Manning, but one of them that looked into his background and the, the reasons or uh, possible reasons for his deep disenchantment with the military, um, uh, Mr. Assange didn't like much. Uh, and he particularly disliked a profile that we wrote of him uh, that John Burrs wrote and we ran on the front page, which talked about um, the divisions and tensions within WikiLeaks as an organization, um, which a number of his colleagues attribute to, to his um, rather domineering management style. Well, you know, what I have said from the very beginning of this is that WikiLeaks was a source. Uh, they were not a partner in, you know, in the sense that to some extent the, the Guardian was a partner in this because we swapped thoughts back and forth about you know, here's an interesting cable that we found, maybe you'll be interested. Uh, we had no kind of, none of that kind of give and take with WikiLeaks. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I have no idea whether um, WikiLeaks is going to offer us anything again, but I, I would accept, you know, accept it on the same terms as, as uh, I accepted the earlier documents as, um, you know, raw material that we would look at and, and write about if it's interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, Simon Wilson, I'm a former Neiman fellow, now back at work with the BBC in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen Carroll uh, told us this morning that the Associated Press had been in discussions with WikiLeaks, but found some of the conditions that they were trying to impose on an arrangement with the Associated <coughs> Press to be unacceptable. Right. I just wondered if, if you knew what conditions had been imposed on The Guardian, and whether that would affect your decision to accept the cables <coughs> via The Guardian, because obviously this is clearly an issue that, that many news organizations went through with some sort of discussions with WikiLeaks and right. some came down on the side of working with them and others felt it wasn't possible. And if, you know, is there anything you've agreed to? And yeah. if so, why was that acceptable? Well, you know, it's been reported, I, I have no first-hand knowledge of this, but it has been reported that um, uh, near the end, a, a week or so before the first publications of the embassy cables, <coughs> WikiLeaks approached um, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, um, I guess AP as well, uh, and at least in some of those cases, the conditions included um, an embargo, which is fine, but they had to sign a document 
pledging, I'm told, I, I can't vouch for this, but, but it was, uh, the Washington Post wrote a story on this. Uh, they were, uh, they agreed, they had to agree to pay a substantial fine if they violated the embargo, uh, and WikiLeaks had the right to take them to court in the country of its choosing. Um, I can't imagine any editor signing the, uh, anything like that, and, none, and, the, and they did not. Um, we signed nothing, uh, we paid nothing, we agreed to nothing except the embargo. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, I mean, as far as I know, The Guardian was in essentially the same position as us, but I wasn't there for their conversations, so I can't really speak, speak to that. Uh, maybe somebody in the way back. I was talking about you know, the setup for investigative reporting. Um, it's really interesting to listen to the calculus around how you make your decisions with this data that has to do with government information. Uh, with the exception of the Pfizer story, it was all government. WikiLeaks is talking about having um, a trove of data on American banking. How does it change if you get that data? How does the decision making change? How does the conversation change? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, one 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 thing that I omitted from my um, long-winded description of the process we went through was uh, I got omitted it because I think it's pretty obvious as we had lawyers involved uh, along the way, and um, you know, to to we have some very good lawyers at the New York Times, the kind of lawyers who see it as their responsibility to help us get things into the paper, not to keep things out of the paper, um, uh, and everybody should have such lawyers. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we obviously talked to them about, you know, is there legal jeopardy for us uh, to some extent because at least initially the material was in the possession of the Guardian, which was in England, and therefore possibly uh, subject to British law, which is considerably um, less freewheeling, say, than American law. Um, so, you know, we did a lot of consulting with the lawyers and, and ascertained that what we were doing was legal. So. I don't know whether the legal situation would be different with documents coming from uh, a private entity, um, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not not going to speculate about whether it would be or not. But the first thing we would do is, you know, is check with the lawyers to find out, you know, is there, um, you know, some, is, is there a legal problem with um, using this material, uh, and if so, is there a way around it? <laughs> and I guess would be our that would be the the sort of nature of the conversation. Um, beyond that, I, I don't see a kind of qualitative difference between um, government information and information about other major institutions. Uh, I mean, it would, it would be different if it were about a sort of, you know, non-public figure, ordinary person. Uh, you know, I think I would feel some qualms about, you know, exposing. I, don't, I can't imagine what the situation would be. But in the case of a, of, of a major American bank, uh, uh, and in the case of documents that actually taught us something about what was going on inside that bank during the financial crisis, I'd be very interested in that, and I think the public would be too. And, and the fact is, um, we've published a fair number of uh, stories based on uh, secret information from inside banks. Yep. I, I couldn't have more from your journalism yeah. too. Uh, would you be troubled by an espionage prosecution, uh, espionage act prosecution of Julian Assange? And uh, if so, or if not, could you elucidate um, any legal difference you see between the Times's uh, publication of these documents and the release of these documents? Um, I'm not a lawyer, and um, and I think our lawyers would kill me if I tried to answer that question. <laughs> no, I'm not the question. Huh? Would you be troubled by an espionage act prosecution of Julian Assange? Um. <clears throat> Let me back into that question a little because, you know, one of the questions that was lobbed at you guys on your panel was, was this question of whether or not WikiLeaks, you know, constitutes a a media organization. If it, is it a journalistic organization? And my answer to that is, I mean, as I said, I, I try to be a little humble about deciding who gets to be called a journalist and who doesn't, and and uh, and I try to be fairly expansive in my definition. I mean, the two things that I would say about that are that I don't. Feel a kind of I don't I don't re kind of regard Julian Assange as a kindred spirit. If 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 he's a journalist, he's not the kind of journalist that I am. Uh, and second of all, that WikiLeaks has moved more in the direction of, of behaving like a journalistic organization from the outset, as you you said in your panel this morning. 
Um, I mean, they have gone from uh, an absolutist view of transparency uh, with a at least suggested motive of, um, uh, of you know, um, embarrassing or bringing down, uh, you know, bad governments um, to uh, an, an organization that has been, um, you know, eking out, the, leaking out the documents, you know, uh, in a more journalistic fashion, um, redacting them. Um, you know, I don't think that they've become, as I say, my kind of news organization, but they, but they have evolved. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I, th I think legality aside, uh, it, it, it would send up a bit of a, uh, an alarm signal to me. Um, uh, as it, just as, a, as an editor, as it did when, uh, when they went after the, the guys at APAC. Not um, because I'm um, saying that Julian Assange <coughs> is or is not culpable of doing something wrong. And in fact, we just reported yesterday or today, yesterday I guess, that no, this morning I think, that uh, the Justice Department is, seems to be trying to come up with an argument that WikiLeaks is culpable not under the Espionage Act, but, uh, but allegedly for uh, encouraging Bradley Manning to violate his uh, responsibilities. Um, but I mean, I, you know, just as an editor, I find the Espionage Act a, a kind of, uh, you know, scary thing in the wrong hands. It's, a, it's an abusable law. Yes, sir. Uh, Barry Sussman, I am okay. on the Human Watchdog website. Uh, you said that you uh, had discussions with the State Department uh, and they had objections to a, a number of things. Can you put a number to the uh, amount of material that you held up because of that? Are there cables you didn't run? And also, when you decided, if you decided not to run some, how did you work that with your colleagues in Europe? Did they defer to your judgment in each instance? Um, in most cases, yes. Uh, I mean, we, um, each of the news organizations made its own attempt to redact the documents. And in some cases, other, uh, other news organizations posted documents that didn't have any great interest for us. Uh, you know, El Pais has done a lot of things that seem not terribly interesting to us, but to a Latin American audience. You know, might be more interesting. So they, so they were uh, uh, posting documents that we were not posting, um, and they made their own attempts to redact them. But we passed along to them all of what we had decided to do, and what the State Department had requested us to do, uh, for them to decide, obviously, on their own. I can't really put a number on it, I mean, and it's because we did so much, you know, redacting, kind of common sense redacting on our own. Um, you know, it would. It would be a misleading answer if I if I if I had a number. Yeah. You just talked like kind of your relationship with the other news organizations during this process. How would the process have changed had you been the only recipient of the WikiLeaks documents, and, and how or if your competitors would have been the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post rather than Deutsche Spiegel and and El País? Yeah, I mean that's that calls for a lot of speculation. I mean. <clears throat> Um, if, if we had it all by ourselves, it would have, uh, I think, been a lot simpler. Um, I mean, you know, getting journalists to cooperate is like herding cats. Uh, although there are, you know, I mean, there are precedents. We've done it in the past, notably in 2000, when a, a lot of newspapers, including, I think, the Washington Post and our direct American competitors, organized a consortium to do a, a, to recount the ballots in Florida. Um, uh, and that was a bit of a management um, undertaking too, um, but and, you know it's always it's always easier if you have the, if, you, if you don't have to involve a whole lot of other people. Um, how would it have been different if we had, um, you know, if it had been the Washington Post instead of the Guardian? Uh, well, I mean, I th I think probably we would not have had some of the kind of casual water cooler conversations that we had with the Guardian about, you know, did you happen to notice cable number blah, 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 which is sort of interesting. I think we would have tended to be, to hoard those bits of information for ourselves. Um, uh, but, you know, but otherwise, 
you know, I, I, I can conceive of such a collaboration. We can take one more question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, uh, Terry Koyam, I'm a photographer. Um, and this is kind of tangential, I guess, but I was in Afghanistan a few weeks ago when Joe Silva uh, had his legs blown off. Yeah. And um, I was wondering what kind of policy does the New York Times have when this kind of thing happens? And is it different if the individual is a freelancer or a staffer or if they're one of the local hires, like a driver or a fixer or a translator? Our policy is that if somebody is doing work on our behalf and they get hurt or injured, then we're responsible. Um, that, that's a policy that we've applied to the families of um, Afghans and Iraqis who died doing work for us. Uh, in Joao's case, uh, although he's a freelancer, we're um, paying all of his expenses that are not covered by insurance, and we have um, uh, uh, committed to put him on staff. Is that a precedent for the way you would treat the next I, one? I mean, every case is, is different. You know, I mean, there are, <clears throat> there are cases that are more complicated where, you know, somebody hasn't been hurt, but they're at risk. You know, they, they, you know I mean, we have a case now of, of somebody, a local uh, journalist who's worked closely with us on some sensitive stories, who has had kind of menacing signals from his government. Uh, he's currently in the States. Uh, we're subsidizing his stay in the States. Um, uh, but you can't kind of draft a policy that applies to every case. I mean, at some point, he'll probably be free to go back. There are others, other cases, similar cases, where people may never be free to go back. So, you know, our policy is, I mean, our policy is we, we try to do our best, not particularly because we're great humanitarians, but because if you want people to work for you, the best people to work for you in dangerous places, you know, it's important to demonstrate that you stand behind them. Question like, if it fell so that had been in a, in a car, for example, and they hit a, a landmine and, you know, him and his driver are, you know, are injured, you consider yourself responsible for both? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. I have to run.